Good morning, I'm Pastor Dustin Abbott from Emmanuel Lighthouse United Pentecostal Church, and I am here for our Thursday devotion. I was uh, reminded of what I'm going to share with you today as I was reading God's Word earlier today, and I read about this situation, a reference to it in the New Testament, but back to something that happens in Numbers chapter 21 that's recorded there. And it's an interesting situation, one of the, the many situations in which Israel murmurs and complains against God during the wilderness or against God's leadership, and God has to deal with them in one way or another. In this particular place, the people, the Bible says, this is Numbers 21 and verse 5, the Bible has said already that the people have become discouraged, and then it says, and the people spoke against God and against Moses, why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food and no water, and our soul loathes this worthless bread. They're talking about the manna, of course, the divine food by which God provides for them on a daily basis. So the Bible says in verse 6, So the Lord sent fiery serpents among the people, and they bit the people, and many of the people of Israel died. And so here we see one of these situations where they, they've kind of gone through the trifecta of, of failure when it comes to their complaining. They've complained against God. They've complained against God's leadership. They've complained against God's provision in terms of the manna that God sends in them. So basically, there is nothing that they are doing right in this moment. And so God begins to deal with this attitude. And unfortunately, it was an attitude that repeated itself uh, again and again with this particular generation that would, as we know, eventually have to die out and be replaced by a younger generation before they could actually go into the land that God had promised them. And so God, in this case, elected four serpents. They're called fiery serpents or poisonous serpents that were allowed to come in amongst the people and they begin to strike people and people begin to sicken and begin to die from it. And so it goes on to record how that the people, uh, they begin, of course, in desperation to cry out to Moses and asking Moses to cry out to God on their behalf. It's always a bit of an irony to me that, you know, here they are five minutes ago, they're talking about how terrible God is and how terrible Moses is, and then they're begging Moses to intercede to God on their behalf. And I think that's a pretty sad indictment on on human nature in general, that we're quick to blame God for everything. But when we're in real trouble, yeah, we kind of know who the only source of help is, don't we? And so in the midst of this, Moses goes to God, and God instructs Moses to do something very, very interesting, very, very unique. And we talked a little bit about it in our, our, our lesson on the Ten Commandments and talking about not having any kind of graven images. Because God actually, this is the one instance where God commands Moses to create the likeness of something and put it before the people. And so he actually tells him to make a serpent cast out of brass and to put it up on a pole where people can see it. And then God says something interesting would happen. If the people will come and as they would look upon that serpent, The Bible says um, in verse 9, So Moses made a bronze serpent and put it on a pole. And so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent, he lived. So interestingly, here is this object that is placed up. And uh, the people were encouraged that if they were were bit, if they could come and they they could gaze upon that, they would be healed. And so a, a really unique situation. And, so, and it's also clear, as we noted on our, our, our lesson about graven images, that this, this bronze statue of a serpent was obviously retained because many generations later, it becomes clear during the time of, of righteous King Hezekiah that that thing which they had named Nehushtan, Nehushtan had become uh, basically an object of idolatry where people were worshiping before it. And the whole point of this obviously was not to try to teach the people that there is some kind of magical healing powers in a statue of a serpent made out of bronze. So why did God choose this particular method as a means of of bringing restoration and healing during this time? It's pretty clear as you continue to study scripture that there was an intent in mind, that this was a foreshadowing of something more significant that would take place. And it was this that I was reminded of in reading my Bible this morning. It was my great, great privilege that my particular uh, part of reading in my Bible today to start in was John chapter 3, which is some pretty fabulous reading. 
And I was reading as a part of Jesus' response to Nicodemus, the religious leader from the Jews that had come by night to ask him questions. And so he says this in verse 14. He says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. And this, by the way, is the segue to verse 16, the one that you all know so well. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And so Jesus actually connects the dots between what happened with Moses and Nehushtan, that serpent in the wilderness, and what would happen with Jesus himself. So let's examine that connection here for just a moment. Going back to Nehushtan for a moment, Nehushtan was a representation of the source of the affliction upon the people. It was the venom of the serpents, those fiery serpents that were afflicting the people and causing great pain and death amongst them. And so Nehushtan being elevated, it would seem kind of backwards if you're trying to flee from the, the cost of the snake, the venom of the snake, why would you look to a snake? Of course, we do understand that a little bit better now, and that anti-venom, anti-toxin, is developed actually from the venom of the serpent. And so, in other words, the cure for a, a serpent's venom is found actually in the venom itself, or more specifically, in the reaction that it can generate under the proper situation. So, the method of creating the antitoxin or anti-venom in the past, which I think is still the process today. There may be a more um, you know, artificial way of doing it at this point, but this is what I'm familiar with, and that is that the venom in small amounts will be injected into a healthy, strong animal, like a horse, for example. And uh, the, the horse will, will sicken, of course, and because it's strong and it's robust, eventually the, it will start to develop antibodies within its, its blood that will fight off the, the effect of the venom. And so um, this process will be repeated with increasing the amount. There will come a place where the, the horse becomes immune to the venom of, of that particular serpent because it has developed so many antibodies that the venom no longer has any hold over it. And it is from then, then you can, you can draw blood, you can, um, you know, you can, in the centrifuge, you can actually withdraw the, the antibodies from the blood and from that develop an antitoxin that injected into anyone can actually be the cure for the venom itself. So that, of course, helps us to really understand the connection that Jesus was making. The Bible tells us that Jesus was sinless. He was that strong, healthy, substitutionary sacrifice. And just like the venom is artificially injected into that horse, for example, um, it didn't actually stray into where the, you know, the viper would be, but it's an artificial process that was brought upon it. Just in that same way, Jesus, the innocent substitutionary sacrifice, he was injected with the sin of the world. And the Bible tells us that he who knew no sin, who had committed no sin, that he became sin. The, the cost, the penalty, the venom of sin was injected into him and he bore the price for us all. But we see something incredibly unique that happens in that though Jesus died upon the cross, because he was that innocent one, that substitutionary sacrifice, the power of sin and thus the power of death had no dominion over him. The Bible tells us that the wages of sin is death. Well, Jesus paid the price that he actually did not have to pay because he had not sinned. And in the process, um, he broke the cycle. He broke the hold of sin. In essence, in his blood became the anti-venom for sin, the anti-toxin for sin. And now those that look upon Jesus, they look upon he who was lifted up upon the cross like Nehushtan was in the Old Testament. But as Jesus is lifted up, that object that is representative of he who becomes sin for us, the Bible says that the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, in 1 John chapter 1, cleanses us from all sin. There is power in the blood of Jesus, the antitoxin for sin. And so if you are watching this today as a sinner, one who has not known God, one who is apart from God, I want to challenge you that the source for your healing is going to be found in looking upon Jesus Christ, the one that is hung up like that, that 
serpent of bronze in the, in the wilderness. But he who knew no sin, he became sin. He triumphed over sin and over death. Thus, the power of eternal life is in the blood of Jesus. And if you will look upon Jesus, you will call upon his name. You will repent of your sins and be baptized in him. The blood of Jesus Christ will be applied to your life, curing the effect, that destructive effect of sin, that death-causing venom of sin. Its power can be reversed because of the antibodies in the blood of Jesus. And so I want to challenge you today. This is a beautiful truth that I want you to latch on to because if you will cry out to Jesus and allow the blood of Jesus to be applied to your life, even that power of sin that has the power of death, its cycle can be broken and you can be cured from the disease of sin and death. And you can find eternal life in Jesus Christ. And as we love in John 6, 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. God bless you. Have a wonderful, blessed day today.